Hello everyone, this is David Irwin Byte, and today we're going to be talking about and explaining to you what the Ordo Theologia is. Um, this a friend of mine recommended me to do this video, his name is Pecheneg, um, or on Twitter his name is Hua Jintao, and right now I don't know what his name is, it's some Chinese letters. I don't read Chinese, I don't speak Chinese, uh, I ain't a Chinese agent, but what I am going to be doing is explaining you a very fundamental um, aspect of how we do theology. And I think this is this question is, well, first of all, before I even start, I will recommend you check out God History Dialectic by Joseph Farrell because this question is very extensively dealt with throughout the first volume. And a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about is from that book. Um, but this, again, this concept is very in instrumental in how we do theology. And let's begin. So what even is order theology? Well, it just means that order, order of doing theology. And a basic way to explain is that what it is, is that there are categorical orders that we deal with when we're doing theology about God. And so it's a prior prioritization of categories. If we, if we look at the categories, the way we orthodox do uh, theology, we start with God as person. Exodus, right? He says, God says, I am that I am. God starts with himself as a person. So we start our theology with God as a person. Uh, then we move on to his energies, his attributes, his operations. Um, and throughout his attributes, we see that these attributes, hey, these are divine attributes, right? These are supernatural divine attributes, energies, so on and so forth. And then we can come to the conclusion that while we don't know the essence of God, we can identify the essence of God and say this is the divine essence, right? God has the divine essence. It's the, it's the essence of the Father. The Augustinian, before I even uh, go on, I mean, this is, when I, when I say Augustinian, I'm talking about the Western order of doing theology. Uh, so it's not something that originated with St. Augustine. And we're not trying to implement some sort of anti-Augustinian sentiment. But uh, St. Augustine was, I believe, the first saint that kind of adopted this inverse order of doing theology. Where he starts with the divine essence. He moves on to the attributes of God. And he ends up with the persons of God. Now if you try to compare right, what our order of doing theology allows us to do. Is that it's personalist. We start with God as a person. We don't start with God as an essence. We don't start with God as an energy. We start with Him as a person. And the way we understand God is that we, we understand Him as a person. He reveals Himself through energies. And that allows us to know that He is divine. Because energies are a faculty of nature. So we can understand that He is divine. Uh, he's, he's divine through his energies. It allows us to distinguish the persons in the Godhead via hypostatic properties. Now, this is, you can only do this with a correct order of doing theology because when you when you start, when you categorically start with hypostasis, um, you can have hypostatic properties that we have used in, in, the, world, in the world of orthodoxy for 2,000 years, basically, where we know God is the, where we know the Father, because He's the sole cause. We know the Son, because He's the only begotten. And we know that the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit, because He's eternally spirated. Um, and it also allows these persons to enter into distinct modes of being that the others do not or cannot. And it also promotes accurate Christology, right? Because in, in, in our order of doing theology, in, in our way of knowing God and who God is, energies and wills, are implied to be rooted in the essence instead of being rooted in hypostasis. So we know that the Son has two natures because of that, because He has a divine energy and will and a human energy and will. And as I mentioned before, our order of doing theology allows uh, allows our theology to be this way. So this is why it's these points are very fundamental. These aren't just like stuff that we made up. These are fundamental points that has been carried over for for a very long time. So if you compare to the Augustine in order theology or any other, if you look at the history of the different order theologies, there's also different mistakes that they make. So for example, certain groups will equate um, person with attributes, right? So they will turn attributes like will into a hypo hypostasis. Arians will do such things, for example. But if you look at 
the or critique of Augustine in Ordo Theology, and even we can extend this to the Monophysite and Nestorian Ordo Theologies, um, it's impersonalist because it starts with God as a simple essence and it inevitably leads to a Neoplatonic sense of simplicity. And if you go on and we can see the traction of history towards philosophers like Thomas Aquinas where we see that because of the different order of doing theology, because they start with the, with the divine essence, every category ends up just being the divine essence and, and they just become manifestations of the divine essence to us, where in reality they're all just the divine essence of person, energy, they're all equated within the divine essence. Now a major problem with Augustine, with the inverse ordo theologia that, that the West and, and the further East, the Orientals have, the main issue is also that they, it does not allow for an orthodox Christology. Because when you put essence categorically superior to, to hypostasis, um, it causes massive issues. So, for example, does St. Augustine and do, does Thomas Aquinas, do they both believe that Christ has two natures, right, two essences? Of course they do. Of course they accept that Christ has two natures. But logically speaking, that should not be allowed. And I think Severus himself, Severus of Antioch, puts it uh, in a lot more consistent form because for him, he says that a, a usia, the substance, is a compendium of hypostases. Right? Because for him, we start with essence. For Severus, we start with essence. And so because of that, uh, hypostasis, if it is distinct from essence, becomes a compendium. Uh, and, and, what, what, and this is even this is the root of why Severus rejects two substances, not just two natures, but two substances. If you read his um, Against the Grammarian, right? In his Against the Grammarian, he actually says you can't have two substances in Christ. If you have two substances, then that means the entire Trinity must have become incarnate. Why does he even think such a thing? Because he believes that essence uh, is categorically superior to that of hypothesis. Uh, by the way, that's also a Nestorian argument. So Nestorius used the same argument against Saint Kirill. He said if the Word became flesh, then the entire Trinity must have become incarnate. I just want to mention it because um, in the 5th century, people heard Nestorius say that and they thought he was an idiot. But Severus said that a century later, now he's a genius somehow. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that a person cannot have a multiplicity of essences because with, a, with an inverse order of theology. You just, it's just impossible. It's just inconsistent to do that. Finally, it's what led to the filioque and Arianesque subordination of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a classic um, J. Dyer argument. Um, if being cause is an essential property, because being cause, in the orthodox view, is a hypostatic property. And we can have hypostatic properties, and you even have hypostatic properties in other Antiochian Christologists like Theodore of Cyrus, um, who, has a, who ends up having a correct order of theology. But if... If um, if you don't have hypostatic properties, if being caused is an essential property, is a property of the essence, then the Son shares that with the Father, and that's how the Holy Spirit was created, right? It's, it's with the Father and the Son as a single principle. But wait a minute. Unless the Holy Spirit generated Himself, the Holy Spirit lacks that property, right? He lacks that essential property of being caused, because He caused no one in the Godhead. And so he lacks an essential property, which raises a question, is he really consubstantial with the Father and the Son? If so, then why does he lack that property? And ultimately, this found again, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that foundationally speaking, this problem occurs because of the inverse order of theology that both, both West and some parts of the East has adopted. So it's not just the West, but also the Monophysite East ended up adopting this uh this, this kind of view also including the historians by the way so what did the fathers say right and and i have a bunch of collections uh collection of quotes from the fathers now does the word ordo theology appear in these patristic quotations no uh, but that doesn't really mean anything because the concept of the order of doing theology is still pretty evident in these church fathers. So let's start with St. Hilary of Poitiers. Uh, this is a pretty long quote. You can check the quote in full if you want by yourself, but I want to focus on uh, the red part where he says, the Orthodox will assert one substance of father and son, but he must not start from that. So we can see from St. Hilary 
uh, that he, he pretty much says we should not start, we should not do what St. Augustine did, right? Or, or what the, the other people do. Obviously, he's not rebuking St. Augustine, but what he's saying is that we should not be starting from the essence. And, and he says that's dangerous. If you go to St. Athanasius, he says, but all scripture everywhere tells us of the being of the word, but none of his being by will, nor at all of his making. But, but where I asked, did they find will or pleasure precedent to the word of God? Unless forsooth, leaving the scriptures, they, they simulate the perverseness of Valentinus. For Ptolemy the Valentinian said that an originate had a pair of attributes, taught and will, and first he taught and then he willed. And what he taught, he could not put forth, unless when the power of the will was added. Thence the Arians, taking a lesson, wish, will, and pleasure to precede the word. So the point here is that, is that the Arians that, that St. Athanasius is combating, they are preceding, first they are preceding attributes, right, will, and, and other things, uh, over hypostasis, over personhood. And St. Athanasius says, you can't do that. You cannot do that. That's heterodox. So you can see some sort of like an order of theology in these church fathers. If you look at St. Vasil, uh, he says in his epistle 52, For they maintain that the homoousion set forth the idea both of essence and what is derived from it, so that the essence when divided confers the title of coessential on the parts into which it is divided. This explanation has some reason in the case of bronze and that the coins that made therefrom. But in the case of God, the Father, and God, the Son, there is no question of substance, anterior, or even underlying both. The mere thought and utterance of such a thing is the last extravagance of impiety, what can be conceived of as anterior to the unbegotten. By, di by this blasphemy, faith in the Father and the Son is destroyed, for things constituted out of one have to one another the relation of brothers. So... From, from this quote, we can see from St. Vasil that if you have an inverse order of doing theology, you can't really distinguish the persons in the Holy Trinity. So and every, every person in the Holy Trinity pretty much essentially becomes fathers to one another. And that's basically his chief point. If you have an inverse order of theology, all persons become fathers to one another. They end up having relation of brothers. Some of you might know St. Vasil's letter 234 um, as one of the letters that prove that he believed in a distinction between essence and energies, but it also proves a patristic order theology. So Eunomius um, had a very different order of doing theology. So he started with father as essence and he will go on with energies and operations and then he will identify the sun and then he will move on to energies and operations and then he will go to the Holy Spirit. So he had a very different, uh, strange order of doing theology. But St. Vasil is basically arguing that if you start with the divine essence, um, you're going to have problems. And he says the way we know the divine essence is through the energies, right? So, so, so it is through the energies that we know uh, the divine essence. And as you, as you can read in the last parts, for they confess themselves that there is a distinction between the essence and each one of the each one of the attributes enumerated. The operations are various and the essence is simple, but we say that we know our God from his operations, but do not undertake to approach near to his essence. His operations come down to us, but his essence remains beyond our reach. And there's also a small essay from... Uh, from from Joseph Farrell that you might you might also have seen this a lot, but he also refers to when he's speaking of the one and when he's comparing the starting position uh, uh, contra Plotinus, he's basically saying that the one or starting position is God as a person. So we can we can construct this order of doing theology and, and understand that Saint Vasil is basically saying that we start with God as a person. And then we know the essence through the energies. So it's person, energies, and essence. So that's the categorical order of doing theology according to St. Vasil. And he's one of the most important Trinitarian theologians. But there are also other fathers, such as St. Gregory of Nyssa. He says, The invisible and incomprehensible is seen and apprehended in another manner. Matter. Many are the modes of such perception, for it is possible to see him who has made all things in wisdom by way of inference through the wisdom that appears in the universe. 
Thus also when we look at the order of creation, we form in our mind an image not of the essence, but of the wisdom of him who has made all things wisely. Wisdom, attribute. We say that we, we have contemplated God by this way, that we have apprehended his goodness, though again not his essence, but his goodness. So he distinguishes essence between his goodness. He who operates can be known by analogy through his operation. So just like St. Vasil, St. Gregory of Nyssa is, is saying that we can know um, him through the operations, right? So we know the essence through the operations. We don't know the operations through the essence in, in the inverse order of doing theology. We don't start with essence. You can't have that sort of a theology. You can't have a theology of the energies if you have an inverse order of doing theology. And finally, for this quote uh, of St. Gregory of Nyssa, I would like to quote Joseph Farrell from God History Dialectic, Volume 1, uh, page uh, 147 in the PDF, which is chapter, Ordo Theology as Applied to Christology and Economy. So the distinction of divine and human natures is clearly taught by Gregory, and the Ordo Theology is the means by which they are recognized. The word was made before the ages, but the flesh came into being in the last times, but one could not reverse the statement and say that the latter is pretemporal or that the word has come into being in the last times. The word was in beginning with God, the man was subject to the trial of death, and neither was the human nature from everlasting, nor the divine nature mortal. So Joseph Farrell continues on to say that this doctrine does not, as Gregory continues, preach a plurality of Christ, but the union of the man with the divinity. There is thus but one person. Gregory might perhaps be misinterpreted as being an historian in this passage, an example as teaching two pers persons in Christ, a divine word and a human Jesus. But if one recall that for him the term man designates not the individual person but precisely the nature, the problem dissipates. Moreover, one, one must remember that the implication of the Ordo Theologiae is that operations and will are rooted in essences. They're not rooted in person. So that's why, for example, for Severus of Antioch, um, energy, will, they're all rooted in hypostasis. That's why uh, their doctrine leads to monoenergism. That's why it leads to monotheletism. It is ultimately because of a wrong order of doing theology. And so the, the, this will cover uh, a lot of the quotes that I had, a lot of the um, things that I had to say in regards to order of theology. So to recap, um, or order of doing theology in orthodoxy is that we start with God as person and then we move on to his energy to find out and identify the divine essence. Now we do as well say that we don't know the essence, right? St. Vasil says we don't know the divine essence, but that doesn't mean that we don't know God. And that's because a uh, person as a category is, is su supersedes when we're doing theology to energy and energy supersedes essence. And the implications are very clear in Christology. A person can enter a mode of being. A Trinitarian person, a person in the Trinity, can enter a mode of being that the other persons do not. And he can adopt a multiplicity of essences. And uh, we can know his essences. We can know what kind of a person he is through his energies. And this is why the order of doing theology, ordo theology is a fundamental aspect of theology, Christology, and everything regarding orthodoxy. So hopefully I managed to teach you something about this crucial topic. Um, hopefully I didn't mess up anything. I tried my best to be faithful to the, uh, to the original material. And I'd like to thank you all for watching. See you guys in the next video. God bless you all. Goodbye.